Hello and welcome back for ECG Case 15. Hope all is well. Hope the weather's treating everybody out there uh, well, depending on where you're from. Uh, I'm in sunny South Florida, so uh, the weather's fantastic down here if you get time to visit during the winter. Um, let's take a look at this ECG case. It was a very interesting case. Uh, I, I give you the case. A uh, patient has been ill for a week. Uh, they've got flu-like symptoms, a cough. Today she's having brief, brief uh, syncopal episodes, and she gets very stiff, like the cerebral posturing. Um, you know, some people might think of this as a seizure-like activity. But the patient then wakes up immediately after the event, so there's no post-ictal period, and she has no pertinent history. Let's take a look at the 12 lead that goes along with this case. So here I've included uh, the interpretive data from the from the GE Marquette algorithm, as well as the uh, numeric data up top. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the 12 lead. Uh, first, we're going to pay attention to our QRS axis, and it's kind of difficult, you know, to tell. Obviously, the first thing we notice with this 12 lead EKG is there's a wandering baseline, a little bit of artifact. Um, we can sort of make out the QRS complexes. I think they're there, there, and there. Okay, um, and they look to be uh, upright in lead one and negative in AVF. So we know we have some sort of left axis deviation. It's not quite pathological left axis deviation since lead two is still mostly positive. And also you can see that the QRS axis is negative 28. So it has to be less than negative 30 to be uh, pathological left axis deviation. So we're not gonna worry or concern ourselves too much with that. Looking at the precordial axis over here in the V leads or the precordial leads, we do have a late R wave progression. Okay, it's an elderly uh, female patient, and it looks like this late R wave progression is probably due to an old anterior wall MI. You'll notice that you have essentially QS waves uh, in V1 through V3, and even in V4 and uh, in V4 and V5, you look to have uh, mostly what looks to be like a QS wave. And it doesn't really have any R wave until you get to V6. So this is a good indication that the patient has had an old uh, anterior wall MI, a probably pretty extensive one. So looking further at the EKG, we're wondering why is she having this decerebit posturing? And one of the things I got to mention to you is this posturing is very familiar, or very familiar to me with certain cases, but very indicative of you know brain anoxia. So. For some reason, the brain's not getting oxygen for a certain period of time. Hopefully, we're going to rule out head trauma. Uh, we're going to rule out stroke, and we're going to, you know, try to rule out other things, and use our 12 lead. Maybe there's something on it. Well, there's nothing much, you know, based on the 12 lead itself, unless you know how to get your QT interval and your QTC interval. Okay, your QT interval starts at the beginning of the Q wave. Okay, let me try to find a good one here. Starts at the beginning of the Q wave, and I'm using V3, okay, and ends at the end of the T wave. Okay, it's your entire refractory period. And generally, it should be less than 460. But as a rule of thumb, it's easy to remember 500, okay? 500 is a good rule of thumb, and also, your T wave should end before the halfway mark between the two R waves. Okay, so if you ever see it near the halfway mark, the end of the T wave, for instance, your end of your T wave is really more like right there. And you can draw, if you find a good one, you can draw the line up and down and find it in all the leads because it's the same, in the same spot, uh, directly above and below it on a 12 lead. And you'll see that this one actually is past that halfway mark between the R to R interval. Um, and so remember that number 500, because once you get greater than 500, you get into an area of potential arrhythmias, all right? And the C in QTC, if you look right here in the numerics, okay, you see it says QT backslash QTC, and the C is stands for corrected. The 12 lead uses a formula called Pazet's formula. Now, I'm not going to teach it because really there's no need to because every 12 lead, uh, modern day 12 lead, does Pazet's formula for you and tells you the QTC interval. And these numbers here are usually pretty accurate. Okay, they're usually pretty accurate. 
Um, and judging by this, obviously, we notice we have a very long QTC interval. Use the QTC interval because it corrects the QT interval for the heart rate. So basically, your, your QT interval changes depending on what your heart rate is, and Bazet's formula fixes that for you. So we are way above 500, okay? So that would prolong our refractory period. And if you try to think about different phenomenons or different arrhythmias that occur with a prolonged refractory period, you'll kind of figure out what's going on with this next 12 lead here. Let's take a look. This 12 lead looks pretty ugly, okay? Um, that's my, you know, medical terminology right there. It's pretty ugly 12 lead. And I, I put the same diagnostics from the previous 12 lead here so to keep us uh, reminded. So he's got, we've got a very long QT interval. And if you remember, uh, back in paramedic school or uh, nursing school or maybe uh, medical school, when you first learned about 12 leads, uh, you may or EKGs rather, you may have heard this thing called an R on T phenomenon. Okay, an R on T phenomenon. And what happens is the next, you know, complex to beat, so let's say it's a premature ventricular complex, uh, beats during the refractory period, and it, it kind of interrupts the cycle, uh, our normal cycle of conduction. And certain arrhythmias tend to occur. Uh, could be VTAC, could be uh, VFib, hopefully not VFib. Um, none of these are good, actually. And torsades is another possibility. Uh, this looks like a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Okay, and I believe it to be torsades. And at, on the monitor, it's very hard to tell on a 12 lead if, if it's torsades or not because we're changing from lead to lead. But on the monitor in lead two, this is what showed up. If you can't see it very well in the video, try to enlarge it. Um, and if you still can't see it, I'll tell you it's torsades de point. Okay, that's the best French I can do. Um, and torsades is this bow tie rhythm and it's basically turning of the points okay turning of the points and it's highly indicative of somebody that has uh, a prolonged refractory period a long QT interval or QTC as we like to look at and that long QT interval is important to know about so it's important to know that they're in torsades versus ventricular tachycardia like a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia or even a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that isn't torsades because it's torsades, we know that there was a great possibility that the patient has a long QT interval, a prolonged refractory period. There's certain medications, or treatments for ventricular tachycardia that we give regularly, such as amiodarone or lidocaine, that we wouldn't want to give to a torsades patient because they're going to prolong the refractory period even worse. That's one of the black box warnings of amiodarone or many other drugs. And doing that, we would make this rhythm very hard to terminate. We would cause them to have a more prolonged refractory period, a longer QT interval, and this arrhythmia could be pretty lethal. Um, so it's important to use the correct drug therapy, which would be magnesium sulfate. Um, if they've got a pulse, obviously you want to give it over 10 minutes because it's a smooth muscle relaxer and we don't want to bottom out their blood pressure. Okay, so... A prolonged QT uh, was the answer for this, and the second 12 lead shows torsades. Um, and the, it's important to start looking at this QT interval. Uh, pay attention. You'll notice that patients that are infarcting uh, often have a longer QT interval. It's a, it's a good way of determining uh, early repolarization versus a possible STEMI. Uh, not all STEMIs have a longer QT interval, but they're usually longer than your early repol patients. So if you have somebody with a QT interval of less than 400, it could, it's a good chance it's early repolarization if you see that nice concave up uh, ST elevation and without any reciprocal changes, of course. Um, so pay attention to that prolonged QT interval and you'll, you'll notice that if you ever get a patient with torsades, they probably had a pretty long QT prior to going into that arrhythmia. Here's the ECG uh, resource for this case study. I'd like to uh, recommend you go over to ecgteacher.com. There's some really great videos on there. If you like these videos, you're going to love theirs as well. Um, you could pretty much learn everything you need to learn about EKGs uh, from ecgteacher.com. ECG so check it out. 
Um, and if you have any questions at all, if you want to talk EKG stuff, if you want to send me a case, send it over to paramedicine101 at gmail.com. All right. Uh, I'm Adam Thompson, and that was case number 15. I will see you next time.